Hey, guys. Look, we just sang, how great is your faithfulness? Uh, I, I showed up at this church when I was nine years old. And I prayed to receive Christ at 11 years old, kind of back now where the parking lot is. Because there used to be a building that went that direction. 11 years old, in the back of Children's Church. I said, Lord, I recognize that I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. Will you come live inside of me today? And a peace entered my heart in that moment, and it has never, ever left. Now, hadn't been easy, but the peace has never left. So I got to grow up at this church. I spent my, uh, my, young, my, my elementary years, then from there, got into the youth group, Pastor Keith, I had the blessing of Pastor Keith being my youth pastor. And as I was growing up, I, I got to look at men and women who were loving and serving Jesus. And I saw them step out in particular ways in ministry. And it taught me what the church is supposed to be about. It taught me this is what Christianity is about. And I'm really, really grateful. Because a lot of those people have died and gone to be with Jesus in heaven. I remember this one dear old man. His name was Lender. How, how do you have, a, what kind of name is that? Is he a banker? Does he lend money to everybody? So maybe, you know, like Davidson, son of David. Maybe, maybe like he was, a, his parents were bankers. And they, either way. This man was a dear, Miss Terry's shaking her head because she remembers him. Dear old man who loved Jesus so much. Came to church in a suit every Sunday coat and tie. And you know what? When I was around 13 years old, we had a prayer time, and this old man stood up and asked for prayer. And I, in this weird, fidgety way, was like, I, I really like Mr. Lender, and he talks to me all the time, and, and we have this cool relationship. And so I just got up, and I, I went over to him, and I just kind of put my hand on his shoulder back here, just kind of, I didn't say anything. I just stood there. And he started crying. I'm like, oh, great. He's crying. What am I supposed to do now? I don't want to hug him. That's weird. So I'm just waiting there, and then the prayer time ended, and I just went back to my seat and stood there. I don't know if we had dismissed. And after church, he came up to me, and he was still crying. And he said this to me. It just blessed me to have somebody so young come and pray for me. You know, that's, that's what the church is to be about. The church brings everybody together. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. If you would open your Bibles or turn your Bible on, like I have, to Acts chapter 2. I, uh, when Harrison was gracious enough to ask me to, to speak this morning, he told me of the, the passage that we would like to, to look at, and I thought back, and I don't think I've ever preached this passage to teenagers. I was a youth pastor here for 15 years, and I don't think I ever, ever preached this passage. So, I don't have old notes that I'm using, <laughs> but it was cool. The Lord showed up in a unique way Thursday as I was looking through the passage and asking the Lord for insights, and few words popped out, and that's why we're going to take some time and look at what this, un I love the title, Unshaken. We have an unshaken, unshakable community as the church. Listen, everybody, just like at 13 years old, something happened in me when I, I prayed for Mr. Lender. I felt part of the church in that moment. Listen. You have a place in this church. This isn't just your parents' church. I know many of you were born into the church. I had the pleasure of announcing your birth for many of you. I announced your birth to the church on a Sunday morning. Yeah, you were born here. So when somebody asks you, so what's your story? What's your, what's your spiritual journey? What's your faith journey? Well, I was born in the church. <laughs> yep, you have that. But listen, 
in those moments, we can think, well, I didn't have any choice. It wasn't like my parents asked me. I was a baby. I had to go where they, when they, where they went. But listen, I hope today it's communicated to you and the Holy Spirit does something unique in your heart that you understand you have a place here. This is your church. Now, I know many of you serve in, in many uh, great ways, great ways in this church. Thank you for serving this church. But you have a place here. God wants you here. So let's look at our passage, Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Lord, we ask that you would do a marvelous, amazing, wondrous work in our hearts today that helps us understand why you have us in this church why you have positioned us uniquely where we are in church so we can, one, experience a foretaste of heaven and also be a light in the midst of darkness in our world. So, Lord, bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What is the quickest way to make something uncool? You can do some audience participation if you have something in mind. I don't mind you saying it. What's the first, what's the easiest way to make something uncool? A, a, a social media app is cool until, yes, exactly right. <laughs> Just have a parent show up. Oh, now everything has been destroyed. There is no cool factor anymore. A parent has showed up. Parent slide on it. Nope. You, you, parent, you showed up. Now it's uncool. Everybody retreats. They have to go find something else to devote themselves to because it's just simply uncool. Now look, when, in, especially within church, there are ways for us to be able to build the glory of God's kingdom community that he brings together as a church. But we also need to be aware of the generational differences that will subtly creep in and sabotage the unity that God wants us to have as parents and teens. Listen, God wants you to be together in church. He wants you to be together in family. Now, there are times when you can be doing your own thing. That's cool. But look, God's design is that we would be together for the glory of building his kingdom community together. We have to be aware of those subtle things that come in and divide rather than bring together and bring unity. Our culture, our culture tells us that, that parents and students, teens, you need to be separated. I don't know if any of you, my, my youngest is almost 17, so I, I'm, I'm out of touch with a lot of the things that are popular these days. I have been out of touch actually for a very long time. My kids usually have to educate me on what that is. So I don't know if Disney Channel is still popular, but back when my kids were young, Disney Channel was always popular, and I would always point out to them that they would have a, an episode or, or a series, and they would watch this series, and systematically, and nearly all of them, the parents would suddenly disappear. You, knew, have you ever watched the show Ant Farm? Funny show. But it's old. So I said, Look, I'm already dated, so there's something new and there's something popular. Well, the first couple seasons had parents involved. The next two seasons, they're out on an island, or they have this weird school that they're going to that has no parents around. Look, our, our culture wants to subtly bring division, and sometimes overtly bring that division. God's community seeks to bring it together. So three things for us to recognize from the passage today. One, the church is worthy of our devotion. The church is worthy of our devotion. Now, things call for our devotion all the time. Uh, I, don't know how, I don't know how much 
uh, music calls for people's devotion anymore. When I was growing up, way back last century, there were, there were different bands and genres of bands that would call for our devotion. And so you were devoted to country, or you were vo- devoted to, to uh, R&B, or, or you were devoted to this particular, the classical, if you, that's your, what you liked. I don't know, I never knew anybody that was jamming out to Mozart all the time. Like, this is just glorious. But they weren't representing that very well because they probably knew if you show up at a school with all boys, you'd probably get a little teased. So keep that quiet. But there was a devotion that we had. I, I don't know if it's the same type of thing, but, but maybe there's devotion to social media platforms, the ones that the parents aren't on. Right now I know that's TikTok. You know what happens when you get older? You don't feel like learning a new thing. And so you just, Facebook's fine. Yep. I remember when Facebook was new. I remember when just college students had Facebook and all of a sudden it was open to everybody else. I'm like, what's this? Social networking? But we're devoted to some of these things. Maybe there's a gaming platform that you are more devoted to. No, I like playing on that uh, console, not that one. But there's different things that call for our devotions. But listen, ultimately what's calling for our devotions today are ideas, ideologies. What I would, uh, and I want to point out, um, I was a little confused, and I'm glad, no, I don't, maybe the one person who got this answer right we need to do a little prayer with, but the, during the Kahoot, the order of things, that's, they're supposed to happen, that was, Harrison, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, which I'm really glad Harrison is the youth pastor here. That's awesome. I am really, really happy for that. I'm having a hard time seeing individual faces, so I don't know if he's still in here. He's not. That would be, well, you saw having a child was before getting married. Did y'all see that? That is a culturally accepted idea today. So what we have in this devotion is you are supposed to automatically think that, sure, you can live with somebody, you can cohabitate, you can even have a child before you figure out if you want to get married. Listen, y'all, that's not in the Scriptures. And what, what, what we actually see is that when it's not in the Scriptures, it doesn't bring the promise of God's blessing with it. And so if we're going to do things out of order like that, we're actually not going to experience the blessing that God wants for us in that moment. It's not a complete and full blessing. Sure, it's wonderful to have a child, but it's even better when you've done it. Let's get married and then have a child. But that's culturally accepted ideas. There's devotion to that because in our culture, if you stand up and say, you know what, I think it's wiser to get married before you have a child. Everybody says, are you from the Stone Age? I mean, that is so archaic. I can't believe that you would say something like that. And all of a sudden, we're challenged in ways. Well, well, well uh, maybe I. Uh, all right, maybe uh, maybe that's okay. Look, those those are kind of the devotion things today in our culture. There's ideas that call for our devotion. If you're not devoted to them, you're scolded and even mocked. Oh no no no! You are a fool if you don't believe. You believe that you're a fool. See, people mock and make fun of things where they don't have a good argument for them. And so when people don't have a good argument for God because he's right, they'll try to mock him and make fun of him and get everybody else. <laughs> isn't God a ridiculous? <laughs> he's a fool, isn't he? <laughs> I'm scared of him because I know I'm under his condemnation. <laughs> That's everybody. That's everybody. But look, church is worthy of our devotion because church is cool. Our experience here, as we are experiencing church, listen, y'all, it, it lasts forever. What we are doing on this side of heaven, as we have prayed to, as we have repented of our sins and trusted Christ for salvation and the Spirit resides within us, this Holy Spirit, he is, he is expanding our capacity to experience Jesus in heaven as we do this, as we sing to the Lord, as we, as we worship, as we hear the word and something in our hearts opens up, our minds are like, wow, well, yeah, God does make sense. Look, that is creating in us and it's expanding our capacity to experience God in heaven. When I, uh, when I was young, a teenager in this church, uh, I used to hear the phrase a lot, you know, when we get to heaven, it's just going to be one long thousands of years worship experience. And I used to think, that doesn't sound fun to me. 
because there are some worship songs that I just don't like. And sometimes I'm tired of standing and I want to sit down. But I feel like if I sit down, everybody's going to look at me and judge me. So I had this weird thing going on in me. Like, did everybody say there's going to be one long worship experience? That's all heaven's going to be? Well, sure, we'll live it up here. This is the fun. Heaven doesn't sound fun, but I had the wrong conception of what heaven is. Heaven is every good thing that we experience on this earth, exponentially personified and, and exponentially gained in heaven. So whatever you love on this earth that is not sinful, whatever you love on this earth is going to be exponentially personified for our experience in heaven. I used to ask the Lord, please don't come back. Jesus, please don't come back until I'm able to get married because I want to have a big family. Flat out just said, I want to be able to have physical intimacy with my wife and Jesus. I know there's none of that in heaven and I don't want, I, so please wait. But you know what, what I was limited why was I thinking that heaven would be a, redu a reduction of our experience here on earth? So maybe our experience in heaven actually is the, the height of what we experience physically in a marriage because we are married with Christ. It doesn't get gross and ooh. But listen, that experience, I believe, is what we are going to live in in heaven. We're going to do stuff? Yeah, we're going to do stuff. Jesus said we're going to rule with him. I'm not sure what that means, but we're going to rule with Jesus. We are going to be kings and queens with Jesus. Let your imagination go. What does that mean? But we'll be able to explore. We'll be able to build things. We'll be able to do things, build, build a car that lasts, a ten, lasts 10,000 years. You don't have to change the oil in it. I mean, that type of stuff. We'll be able, our minds will be unlocked to be able to see, uh, uh, comprehend the glory of God in ways that translate into what we're doing. Yeah, we'll do stuff. And then Jesus will come by. We'll take our crowns. We'll cast them at his feet. We'll worship. We'll maybe worship for a year. Time's not going to be anything. But then Jesus will come over to us and he'll put the crown back on our head and say, what are you doing? Oh, Jesus, this is what I'm doing. Building a roller coaster. Oh, that's great. Can I ride it with you? Oh, please, come on. Let's ride that roller coaster with Jesus. Let's go way up, straight down. We're going to do stuff. But look, our experience in church helps us imagine what heaven's going to be like because we, those relationships are still there. We're, we're still going to remember one another in heaven. And our friendships, which is good, will continue to progress and be exponentially personified. Now there's objects of devotion that we see in the passage where, where the culture is calling for objects of devotion. What do we see in the passage as objects of devotion? The first one is the apostles' teaching. Yet we are devoted to teaching and doing stuff like this because when our minds are stretched and we open, God opens our minds to consider him, something in our hearts, our affections are drawn out and we say, oh God, you are so great. In that moment, we want to live differently, right? That's, that prepares us for heaven. But there's a devotion to that. We're going to do that. The devotion to fellowship, the devo uh, devotion to the friendships that we're supposed to have, that we, we have not, not just commonalities because we like the same things, commonalities because we have Jesus at the center of everything. And we want to remind each other of the, of the glory of Jesus together. The breaking of bread, that, that meant literally communion. Breaking bread, as Jesus said, every time you do this, remember. Yeah, it's communion because it celebrates, and I love... Communion is, is, communion and baptism, they're, they're the gospel for our eyes. We can see the gospel in those moments. So we're reminding ourselves of the gospel. But the breaking of bread really is eating together. Like, what, what, we, what we experience with food here at Lakeview Christian Center is the glory of heaven, right? It's good food. And it's great. Y'all aren't with me on that? You good? It's like, pfft, we're so used to Mr. Pete. Yeah, we're used to it. We go to restaurants, and it's like, this tastes like Alpha. Yeah, it sure does, doesn't it? <laughs> That's what happens. But look, there, we, we celebrate the friendships. We celebrate doctrine. We celebrate Jesus together around meals and also prayers, meaning that we, we are praying for one another. We are seeking to experience God right now together. But what's the effect of that? What does the Scripture tell us? The effect of that is awe. The effect of that, signs and wonders being done by the apostles. Look, the ordinary stuff that we do 
that can seem so mundane, it can seem so boring, isn't this again? Yes, every time we approach that by faith, listen, we have to have an expectation that God's going to do something in that moment. So when you pray over somebody, you have the expectation, if they're asking for healing, whether it's physically, emotionally, spiritually, that they get that healing in that moment. We have an expectation level that actually matches God's expectation for how we're here. God wants us to experience all in this moment. To be able to look at Jesus and be stunned by him and say, Lord, I don't want to leave this place. Like like Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and they see his glory. God, in that moment, Jesus, he, he let his glory shine through his flesh and it didn't melt his flesh. He lets his glory out and Peter goes, it's good that we're here. How about we set up some tents? And stay. What did Peter, he wanted to stay in that moment. He didn't want to leave it. And look, it can be so easy for us to always be thinking about the next thing that we're going to do. The next thing that we're going to do. The next thing that we're going to do. And not take the moment to say, Lord, you have me right here. And I don't care if your parents made you come. God wanted you to come. God, you have me here. Speak to me. Because I want to be awed in this moment. I want to see you, and I want a a, a wonder. I want to experience the wonder of who you are, and I I, I want want my life to be a sign for people to see Jesus in me. So the effects of our devotion are there. God wants us to experience those things as we come to church. So the church is worthy of our devotion. The church brings us together. This would be in verse 44 if you're following along in your Bible. But when you have that together, they had all, they were, all who believed were together. Let's talk a little bit about the generational divide that we experience in our culture. Uh, it happens with fashion, different styles, hairstyles, all that stuff. And it's weird how it's cyclical and it comes back, it comes back around. Like every 20 to 30 years, there's the, the things that used to be popular kind of come back around. It's odd how that happens, but it does with our appearance. We want to look a particular way. So there's, but look, every generation experiences this difference. Well, you know, what, what has not come back is the big flappy, flowy pants of MC Hammer from the late 80s and early 90s. And Z Cavarici, that was a popular... Like, like that hasn't come back, but bell bottoms have made a return. Uh, weird. It's odd. Like my my parents' generation wore the bell bottoms. You were like, we're not wearing bell bottoms, but yet got some millennials like, oh, bell bottoms. That'll be fun. Let's bring that back. Hairstyles. I mean, all, all of it. It's just it's weirdly cyclical. But something that you look back on is like, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Language divides us. I say the word Ohio. Everybody in the back's like, it's a state, Cleveland, Cincinnati. Everybody else is like, doesn't exist. <laughs> yep, Ohio, language divide. Look, to say that some, like, like Riz, let's talk about Riz a little bit. There are, there are, Riz is not a, it's, it's a new word to describe something that every generation has sought to describe. It used to be that dude is smooth or... Suave. That was popular about 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> so we have these different ways, of it, or it might be like a guy's got game. There's different ways to describe that, but we have this generational divide. So you walk up like Riz, and it blows my mind. I'm going, what? What does that mean? How about this? Skibbity toilet. Skibbity toilet. See, right now, the parents are like, I have no idea what that means. And all the teens, you have no idea what that means either. It's skibbity toilet. What in the world could that mean? But yet, I don't know, skibbity toilet. From a meme with it's funny with a dude's head. I just learned I just learned this phrase two months ago because I happened to walk. Uh, my my son Owen was watching YouTube and he was watching a video that he this older guy was being asked questions about his Gen Alpha girls and if he knew their lingo. And I went, 
skivity, I think I mispronounced it first. <laughs> he had to instruct me on even how to say skivity toilet. I went, that's one of the dumbest things that I've ever heard. But yet, listen, those are the subtle ways where it comes in and it seeks to divide. Listen, every single generation seeks an identity. And you actually seek an identity that's different and separate from the, the, the generations that have come before you. And you want to have your own personality. You want to have your own things. That's why you grab onto words. That's why you grab onto songs. You try to grab on. Now your generation is grab onto memes. I mean, that's the biggest thing. We got to grab onto that. We own it because we want that to define us. But we have to be careful because those things can be the very things that divide us. It's all right to have personality. That's cool. It's all right. We don't, we don't all wear the same things, say the same things. No, that, that's creepy. And we don't want to do that as the church because that, that's when people walk up and like, oh, you go to church? <laughs> yeah, I don't want to go to your church <laughs> because you're a little off. And I'm not sure I, I don't want to look like that. Now, we have personality. God gives us that. And we are able to maintain that personality within the unity that God gives us as the church. But listen, it's centered around Jesus. That's what it's centered around. Can have our, our styles and stuff, making sure that we are, we're, we're going after Jesus. Because listen, when we, when we seek that identity as a generation, we will look at previous generations before us as outdated or outmoded. You're not in touch with who I am. And so, something get, something's going on in your life and you go to your parents, your parents are asking you about it and they're saying, hey, here's what I think would be God's wisdom. The temptation in your mind is you don't understand what I'm going through. That's a division thought. Look, all the temptations of how to solve the insecurity in us, those are different, but the temptation is the same. We all want to solve the insecurity and the, the disheartened, the brokenness that we feel inside of ourselves, and every generation has a different answer for it. So let's talk about generational unity. If those are the things that divide us, what are the things that are going to bring us together? Look, all who believed, I love right there, there's no age separation. All the adults that believed, all who believed were together. They were unified. They were doing the same things. They had all things in common. These are the things that really matter. These aren't the secondary things. These aren't the, they all had the same haircut. It was great. No, they, it's the, they had Jesus in common. They had Jesus together. Because our, our personal expression Remember, it's okay, but we are centered on Jesus and exalting him together. And there's some serious sacrifice happening in this community. They, the community, they're selling their possessions, and they're distributing to anybody that has need. Look, that's, that's, that's not so much, that should be a characteristic of a, and a desire that we have within the church, but listen. That's about the sacrifice that resembles Jesus' sacrifice. Who did what? Gave himself completely for us. So the things that we do for one another exalt Jesus. The serious sacrifice that we do for one another exalts Jesus. And what's the after effect? Gladness and generosity. They receive their food in their homes with glad and generous hearts. And it's a gladness that doesn't go away because the temperature changes or maybe the temperature becomes, maybe we wait for, I love cool weather, I love October, and maybe it's because, oh, finally cool weather, I can be happy. No, it's a lasting peace. See, there is, there's generational unity when we're doing that and we're, we're imaging Jesus to one another. Guess what we're going to do? We're going to image Jesus to the world that's looking. So third point, the church is visible to the world. The church continues to be the church even when they're not in the building. When the building is empty, they still are the church. They're going house to house, and they're meeting with one another. They're encouraging one another. They're attending the temple together. They're breaking bread in their homes. They're having then favor with all the people. This is true influencing. This is not an influencing that comes from the self-satisfaction that we get because our post got a lot of likes. This is an influence that's, that's grounded in Jesus being exalted and it's promised that when Jesus is exalted, he will draw men to him. He will draw us to him. That happens in our relationship. When we exalt Jesus, we're drawn to him. But when we exalt Jesus, the lost is drawn to a light 
and says, what is that that you have? Because I recognize I don't have it. See, when the church is the church, people get saved. And the church fulfills the mission of the church. Go, make disciples, baptize, I'm with you always to the end of the age, Jesus says in the Great Commission. So look, your mission, God, like if you, if you ever think of the question, God, why am I here? What's going on? What's my purpose? Your purpose is to exalt Jesus with everything that you are because that is your best and most happiest and thrilling, successful life that you can ever imagine. But your purpose is part of the purpose of the church. Everybody has to own that purpose together. So when you fulfill your purpose, the church fulfills her purpose, and guess what? The world is affected. The world is changed. See, there's a great ability to have people come to church, but the church also needs to be able to go out we need to be able to affect, but the church goes out every time we leave this building. That's when the church goes out. Yeah, we, we have things we can invite people to. We come, we're, we're edified, we're encouraged. But when the church goes out, the mission is still there. The light still goes farther. And it goes every, every place we step. So your mission is wrapped up in the mission of church, which is this, to glorify and exalt Jesus. So here's my conclusion. Jesus is cool, and so is his church. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for all the memories that I have that have really been flooding my mind as I've been back in this building. Thank you that all of my memories are the, the evidence of your faithfulness throughout my life personally. And Lord, I thank you for the story that you are writing with everybody sitting in here who calls this church home, or maybe whatever church they're a part of. Lord, you are writing a story that is unshakable because it's a story of how your gospel penetrates into our hearts, changes and renovates everything, turns it upside down so our affections and our thoughts and our wills are all consumed with you. So, Lord, do the awesome work in this moment of, of allowing us to see your smile over us and allowing us to feel your love. Lord, that is awe. And it causes us to wonder and it causes us to live as the signs. But, Lord, we ask that you would, in our meetings, give us an expectation God, you are getting ready to do something right now. You're going to shake something so, so, so what needs to fall off falls off so what can remain can be there and what remains is Jesus. So Lord, please draw us to you and thank you that you have given us a place in your church. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. There he is.